Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. Now today I talked to a Malaysian named Ainun Ayob who works at a, a boutique investment uh, company in London called Brown Brothers Harriman and that has been uh, recently taken over by State Street Advisors, a big global investment fund. Um, she's been doing quite well in London the last few years and I took this opportunity to talk to her on Zoom to try and get into, into her head in terms of what it takes to succeed as a female and as a Malaysian uh, working abroad um, especially in the light of recent new surveys in Malaysia that talks about how the brain drain in Malaysia is accelerating. And so I wanted to impart, uh, or to get her to impart some of her wisdom in terms of what it takes to succeed abroad. We also talk about how uh, the financial markets are evolving really, really quickly and how they're coalescing with uh, digital finance and digital banking and cryptocurrencies, which are also uh, evolving as quickly as uh, the internet is. I hope you enjoyed this uh, podcast. Um, she was very candid, very honest, and very insightful. I also enjoyed reaching out to her and uh, getting her to, t to talk to me in such an honest way. If you like it, please uh, do subscribe, uh, share it, and uh, tell me what you think in the comments below. Take care and thanks for watching. I know Nayob. Um, we've been going back and forth on on, on um, WhatsApp and um, Google Meets for the last few weeks. Been trying to get you on to my podcast, um, and finally we are, we're doing it. So thank you for doing this. Um, I'm really looking forward to chatting with you. Um, if we can just kind of like dive into the, the nuts and bolts of why we're talking today, um, you know, I I I came across you from that new newspaper article when you were on the short list of um, successful uh, women in European finance. And then I discovered that you're actually from Malaysia. You used to work in Malaysia. You went over back into the... U I think you were born in the UK. Then you went back to yeah. Malaysia to work. And then you've come back to the, to the UK to work. Um, I want to bring this whole conversation up right up to, 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 the, to, the, to the current times. And there's been a lot of uh, uh, news in the current uh, era about... Malaysia losing its its best brains to you know to the best companies abroad, and they did a survey among young people, and uh, a lot of Malaysians, young Malaysians, well qualified Malaysians, said they would much rather be working abroad, and there was a whole bunch of reasons for doing so. Um, I, I'll leave it up to you to talk to me about why. Um, I guess you decided to go back to the UK, um, and I think I think more broadly after that to kind of like expand the discussion into what it takes to succeed. In, in you know in a very competitive uh, market abroad so over to you so i do think that the grass is always greener you always want some adventure you want uh, to explore new territories and um you want to be able to say that i've tried it um and then your definition of success t tells you whether you make it or not right um and that's different to for for different people so for me, uh, like you said, I was born here um, where my parents were students in the swinging 60s. And uh, uh, but we went back to Malaysia. I grew up there, you know, so I grew up in Ipoh uh, and uh, I'm still in touch with my school friends. Um, you know, mo most of my family, my sisters are there. I have five sisters and, um, you know, a lot of um, my life is still in Malaysia uh, in terms of the people I care about and the people who I'm still in touch with. In terms of career, um, I spent, uh, I, I came to the UK to study. I went to the LSE, I did economics, monetary economics. Um, and then I went back to Malaysia. I worked for seven years. Uh, and um, in 2001, I decided to move here just to try it try what it's like to work uh, in London because um, I always loved London. And um, I was in a strange place in, in my career in that I was uh, an equity analyst in, in Malaysia uh, for the tail end of the tech boom, which didn't make any sense to me because uh, it's uh, people buy because of the way the prices are going up, not because of the intrinsic value of the underlying companies. So I thought, mm, this is nonsense, so I'm going to do something else. Um, when I came here, it was actually very difficult to break in to, uh, to take my financial knowledge in Malaysia and to apply it to the UK. Um, and to be honest, I wasn't trying very hard because I thought I really wanted to try something different. I enrolled uh, at the Open University uh, to do psychology. And um, in order to earn a living, I was working in, a, I happened to stumble on a fund of hedge funds platform 
which meant nothing to me at the time because all I knew was banking. Um, but it was a, a, I'd say a startup. It was a few years on, but it was still in startup phase and it was expanding quite rapidly. And uh, the need was for people who understood how these platforms worked. There are a lot of people who come from big banks, for instance, who know how to invest, uh, but they don't understand how everything else works because in a big bank, everything is functionalized. You just hand it off to someone else. So this company I was with was like that. It had a lot of senior people who had come out to set up their own shop, um, but very thin on the ground on people who actually knew the day-to-day -day stuff. So in a very short space of time, I became um, quite good at uh, creating um, all sorts of things. I had to learn everything by myself, right? Because there's no one to teach you, uh, especially with the alternative side of the business. Um, of, of the industry um, so so that was fun that was really fun because I had to google how to become a hedging expert um, I had to figure out how to do complex calculations for allocation to salespeople for instance uh, who are selling all, all over the world um, and I had to get to know the funds industry uh, right now the funds industry is 100 trillion in size <clears throat> And it comprises of asset managers who uh, have so far grown very, very far and very fast by investing in the stock market. So those are the mutual funds uh, that, that we all know about, they're in unit trusts and so on. Um, but alternatives is about 10 percent, <clears throat> excuse me, it's about 10 percent of that, that 100 trillion and growing very rapidly, probably more rapidly than the, the, the rest. Um, of course, coming up very closely behind is digital assets. Um, and, and so that's another f new frontier that everyone is looking at. But how I've stayed interested in it and why I think I succeed is because um, I'm, I stay curious and I stay diligent at finding out what's going on in the market and um, being ahead of where everybody is in terms of how new things are coming up. So by the time it's hot, uh, I'm already an expert. And I do this not because I'm deliberately looking out uh, to the future and saying, oh, I want to be an expert in this, so therefore I must do this. I'm actually genuinely driven by curiosity uh, and passion. And uh, the alternatives business is growing, so I have a platform to speak. Um, I'd say, uh, I probably am where I am because I bothered to teach other people about this industry and therefore mobilize my whole organization to be successful in this space. Um, and I think that's what they liked in terms of the um, the profiles of people they were doing for this uh, European Women in Finance. Yeah, you know, I know this whole idea that um, learning should be continuous uh, and one should always stay curious and in a way naive, in, uh, a la Steve Jobs, right? Uh, it, it appears to be a given for, for people to survive or even to succeed in, in a world which is as volatile and as unpredictable as, as we are today, especially as, as COVID demonstrated last year. The thing is, in, in Malaysia, um, there's this criticism that um, we live in a bit of a nanny state, especially when you know, the social policies are concerned and we are not, as a result, competitive enough. So, you know, a lot of people in Malaysia who do benefit from the social uh, policies do, I guess, over time become less competitive and less diligent in terms of understanding what it takes to succeed. So I was looking to you because you, of all people, you've got several uh, deterrents, if you like, uh, uh, you know, militating against you. First of all, you're a girl. Well, a woman, you know, a female. Second of all, you're Asian, um, and you're in a minority. Perhaps in this day and age, there can be a benefit, but you know, conventionally, there's this whole glass ceiling idea of this whole, um, you know, um, white privilege and, and male privilege, especially in a world as competitive as global finance, right? So, um, I was looking to you, you know, to, to perhaps give me some some meat and bones in terms of. You know, beyond staying competitive, in terms of beyond continuous learning, right? Um, how is it that you are able to survive, you know, in London and 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 prosper and, and get onto the short lists of, of uh, finance awards when you know it's obviously a, it's a tough world out there, you know. Um. Yes, it's very tough, and finance is uh, bruising. I've been 
uh, I think the biggest change for me was moving from a boutique uh, and this was um, from a, when my boutique got taken over by a big American bank uh, and it's State Street and to be honest it's very kind, very compassionate, very uh, open-minded about many things but it's a huge machine. Uh, you know, we went from, um, you know, my, my, I was head of operations at the time in London uh, a, and we were 60 people uh, and part of a, a big organization, but, you know, numbering the hundreds. And we went to an organization that numbered 50,000 at the time. Uh, it's smaller now, but deliberately so. Um, and it was such a huge uh, shift in thinking because we'd gone from, uh, being able to make decisions in two or three phone calls and maybe two or three meetings, but very quick, very decisive, into going into a very highly regulated global financial institution that had a lot of rules and regulations, um, and rightly so. Uh, and decision making was much more complex uh, and slow, and um, you have to adapt, right? And you you either decide. When, when change happens, and change happens all the time, right? Um, you either decide to stick it out and figure it out, or you move somewhere else and figure it out there. And um, sometimes I've stayed to, to figure it out, and sometimes I've moved. And that's a judgment call, right? To what extent is that environment supporting me to, to succeed and thrive? And to what extent am I able to speak and be heard uh, I've always been a diversity hire. I'm half Malay, half Chinese, uh, with a strong um, you know, British education. Um, and there are many, many reasons for people to push you down. Um, and I don't care what the ism is, for, you know, whether it's racism or sexism or ageism. You know, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting on now, right? Uh, and it's easier to look at younger people, for instance. So I also have to stay relevant and useful and value add. And I never burn bridges. Um, I probably have, you know, in not 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 by choice. But um, it's a small, you know, despite it being a hundred trillion industry, it's actually quite a small group of people who actually do the work I do in my industry. Um, and and um, being visible, I think, is very important. Um, I don't care if uh, the reason that. I'm hired for something, part of it is because of the color of my skin or my sex. I care that I am hired because I am very good at what I do. And I know I'm very good at what I do, so I don't really care if those factors come in to play because I know I'm going to do a good job and I know I'm going to deliver value to the organization I'm with. So I always stay true to that. So if you could impart some words of advice to um, Malaysians yeah, of all color and stripe, um, who, you know, all of us in one way or another um, are laboring through these policies in Malaysia, possibly to the detriment of the country because we are getting less competitive on an annual basis. Um, what, what kind of advice would you give to the young folks or even to folks who do want to evolve and adapt to an uncertain world, um, you know, to, to become, to, to be successful and to stay successful? What what must they do? Um, sh should, should they, sh should they, rely less on the privileges afforded to them and rely more on their hard work and, and merit and industry. Um, th there's so many things to talk about. What, what's your perspective? We are living in an age where um, we can do a lot of things uh, in that my, my parents could only dream of. My mother was very forward thinking in terms of technology. She was one of the first people uh, you know, in Ipoh Garden South to get a computer, for instance. Uh, you help yourself. Uh, a long time ago, um, I interviewed uh, Khatija Ahmad, who set up Kaf Discount, and this is when I was in my 20s and looking for inspiration. And I asked her, you know, what do you do um, when th things get tough, when you don't know what to do? Uh, how do you figure it out? And she looked at me like, the answer is so obvious. That was the expression on her face. You pull yourself up by the bootstraps. That's what you do. You don't rely on anybody else. Figure it out. You have brains. You have tools. You are living in an age of knowledge and technology that has never existed before. And in a time of change where there is help. Um, my sister, uh, I, I don't know, Jun uh, Ayub, um, 
works in Petronas and she is part of the uh, the seed lab experiment and she's a dr big driver for that and seed lab is a setting up a platform for young entrepreneurs to create opportunities for themselves they come up with the ideas and this is a supportive platform to help them build those ideas into reality uh, and with a social bent to it to support the communities that they live in um, and I also have a friend who uh, is uh, who runs a a um, a uh, seed funding uh, sorry a crowdfunding platform called Ata Plus. Um, so so there are many platforms and opportunities available for people if they want it. I think the main reason that stops people from doing anything is deciding to. There's a lot of fear in going into something new, trying something new. That's not got anything to do with social policy. That's got to do with the way we think about our lives. Yeah, and of course, uh, if life is good, then 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 why why shake that boat, right? Um, if we can, let's move the discussion along to you know what you are specializing in, which is the alternatives and um, I guess non conventional markets. I mean that whole side is is moving so fast. Uh, it's it's traveling at the speed of light, and I've been recently you know being caught in a rabbit hole with um, podcasts and YouTube channels where people like Chris Dixon and Andreessen Horowitz and people like Naval Ravikant and the whole um, cryptocurrency um, NFT space is going gangbusters. You talk about how the funds or funds market is a $100 trillion market. Well, I mean, the whole crypto market is worth maybe $1.5 trillion, so there's a lot of growth to go, but it's been going so fast with zero marketing. And the reason it's been growing so fast is because of its decentralized nature. It doesn't need advertising and marketing. It's been growing on its own steam. So I just wonder how much of, you know, of, of the whole crypto space you've been looking at and, um, you know, wh where, is conventional, uh, where are conventional markets in respect of that whole crypto market? So obviously the numbers are eye-popping enough for the conventional uh, industry to take notice and they are working on it. They are investing in platforms and so on. Um, and just to, to just to clarify, so for instance, um, NFTs are probably closer to to what uh, you know, sort of an adjacent asset to the funds industry, because NFTs are uh, non fungible tokens. They act like securities, for, uh, and they basically are, are a a token of ownership of something. That something that has exploded so far is art, but uh, um, and making things like tweets into art. Uh, and being able to sell that, I think that is the real power of NFTs. Um, when you go on an NFT platform, um, it feels more like eBay. Uh, you know, you connect your payment wallet to it, uh, and with a few checks uh, um, for AML KYC <laughs> purposes, uh, you're on it and you can buy and sell NFTs. It's very simple. And that's the kind of uh, user accessibility that uh, the funds market is also looking at. The next wave for the alternatives um, industry is actually in retail. Um, and that has uh, historically been quite difficult because you're basically investing in the whole world, in private markets, uh, uh, um, in companies, in, how, uh, in ho housing uh, developments, in uh, infrastructure developments, in plane leasing, you know, all those are so different. And they are basically very, very big, bulky investments. So how do you split it up to many people? How do you record how much value they have of that individual asset? It's not easy because those valuations are very infrequent. It's not like the stock market where you know what the price is today, even at different times of the day. And so you know what you're buying. But um, it's a very different market. Um, and what the big managers are trying to do is to figure out how to connect the illiquid nature of the investments with the retail nature of what NFT platforms can offer. And it's a big question mark whether that can be connected, but um, there, there is a huge amount of effort, uh, mine included, in trying to figure that out. So, so uh, cryptocurrency, if I can just finish, cryptocurrency is a, a very different ballgame um, because that's to do with m money uh, exchanging hands. What is 
considered a fiat currency that the governments can control and what isn't, which is what crypto represents, which is like an explosion of all different types of currencies. How do the regulators actually keep it safe for everybody? Because otherwise it's just um, a digital number going up and down, up and down, up and down, and you can actually physically lose everything you own and more uh, on it. So how, you know, where's the line between investing and gambling? Yeah. So people like you and me, um, being of similar vintage, shall we say, um, <laughs> we live in the conventional world. I mean, we've been th we've been in this industry, you know, um, in various shapes and forms for the last, you know, twenty twenty five years, and and when I when I when I get stuck in this rabbit hole that I've been in the last few weeks, it just seems to me that this is a parallel universe which has been gathering momentum at a breakneck speed for the last five years, right? Um, I mean, Bitcoin didn't exist before 20, 2009, and, and today it's, it's you know, over a trillion dollars in market value. Um, this is a parallel universe which disintermediates the existing institutions that you and I uh, are aware of and, and, and resonate with, whether it's central banks, whether it's clearing houses, houses whether it's investment banks and, and what have you. Um, the, the thing is, I, I'm quite concerned that if I don't keep up to speed with what's going on in the digital world, um, we will be ossified. We will be left behind. I will be left behind like some, you know, prehistoric dinosaur. And and the thing is, the the beauty about this whole area is that there's huge amounts of alpha to be gotten if, if one understands it. And that's been, you know, manifested on a daily basis, right? Whether it's in, an, in the NFT space or whether it's with new tokens or whether like in, as recently as three, four years ago, it was with ICOs. No, I, I, you know, from your from your perspective, working for you know big big banks and big fund houses like State Street or even you know Brown Brothers, right? Um, where, where, how does it all end up? How does it coalesce over time? Uh, it's human nature, right, to always seek something new and uh, for new frontiers to be created because. Um, if I think about the evolution of uh, alternatives, for instance, it's not alternative anymore. Uh, Ten years, uh, you know, 20 years ago when I started, the allocation t by institutional investors to this space was 1%, 2%, if that. If, if that. Ten years later, it's 8 to 10%. Now it's 15 to 20%. Um, so it's become uh, more regulated and more controlled. Uh, and so people seek other places where there's more opportunity. And the power of the internet is democratizing that as well. You know, the, the likes of Robin Hood, for instance, uh, that platform of investors uh, um, who can collaborate to do things. Uh, um, and that that is evolution. Um, and it's only... The only thing that stops us from uh, doing that is is the fear of change, right? Um, it's not to say that anything is good or bad. Everything can go out of control very fast, right? That's what the regulators are very afraid for, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, people can be very hurt by these uh, these industries which are unregulated. Um, and maybe it's buyer beware, right? Individual investors have to train themselves up to be uh, be aware that that there are risks to all this, like anything else. And I, I know I sound like a, <laughs> somebody our age, as you say, you know, look at the risks, think about the risks. And, you know, when uh, you know, there are a lot of people and it's not to do with age, it's to do with their appetite towards risk, will try things. And the ones who try on a small scale and learn it, um, they're the ones who are going to make money out of this, right? You have to know what you're dealing with. And a lot of the trading skills that uh, exist in FX, in, uh, in, in stock trading, they, they will also apply in, in this. It's just technology has made it so much easier for everybody to learn all this. Yeah, so I, I know you've got two young children as well, and, and both of them are you know, coping with not just life in the UK and a different culture, but also the different weather as well. Um, you know, when, when you talk to them, and I know you're very interested in mentoring, uh, Ainun, you know, that, that's, what, that's why you, you, you're a spokesperson on behalf of the bank. You, you are very, very good at communicating. What, what do you tell your kids in, in terms of you know, trying to make it this, this mad world that we find ourselves in? Trust yourself. 
trust yourself. I cannot teach them what the world is going to look like in five years because I don't know what it is. I don't know how it's going to evolve. I don't have five year plans myself. I maybe set my eyes on certain direction, but I aim more for um, what's in front of me um, because what's in front of me is changing so fast. Um, the, you talk about um, mindset, right? Uh, I think the biggest thing I can teach them and to anybody else I talk to is to trust what you see, but see what's really in front of you. Um, it's human nature to, to look at things in stereotypes and, you know, back to the isms we were talking about, racism, sexism, glass ceiling, whatever, right? I don't want to have the stereotype that I cannot succeed because of all these things. My, my stereotype is what's in front of me, what's the obstacle, what do I have to do? Um, and uh, sometimes the obstacle is too big, I go around it. Sometimes I feel the need to punch through it, not just for myself but for other people. Um, so sometimes you have to do that as well. Um, you think about why uh, a lot of people, good people, don't go into politics it's because they fear the, the nastiness of it. Uh, and, you know, that's what you, you, you know, sometimes people call competitiveness, but that's not competitiveness. That is a scorched earth, uh, scorched earth strategy. Um, how I, you know, how they succeed is by, by destroying other people. Uh, that's not my style. I don't want to play in that game. Um, not to say I don't play the game, um, but um, mm, I have to hold true to my principles as well. So you find ways. People, people can succeed in many different ways. Do what's good for you because that makes you stronger. Do you think, do you have this, do you sense that, you know, when your kids get to 20, 25 years old and they start their first jobs, do you think they should stay in the UK or Europe or even North America? Or do you think they should make the journey across to, you know, Beijing, Hong Kong, Taiwan, where, you know, on, on, the, on the face of it at least, you know, that, that's where the future is? Hmm. I've been remote working in my little room here for the last almost two years. I have been influencing my organization. I've been speaking on panels. I have been able to connect in so many ways that I haven't been before. Uh, and I like it. I think that there are many opportunities and I don't think that it's driven by where you are. I think it's where you are here that matters. Physically, you can go to different places and you will learn many different things. I, I learn a lot of different things. Of course, physically being in the same room as my colleagues makes a huge difference. But don't let that be the barrier. Mm. If you think about it, Malaysia is uh, one of the biggest trading nations in the world. Has that stopped during COVID? It hasn't, right? It's changed. Oh, it's changed. It's, changed. Yeah. it's just changed. So it's more about adapting to change and opportunity and going where you want to go. Um, I think um, Malaysians are very privileged in so many ways. We've got a lot of issues, of course. Everybody has. You know, There are a lot of issues in the UK. Uh, we're dealing with Brexit and COVID and uh, you know uh, energy crisis. You know, gas prices have gone through the roof. So a lot of gas suppliers have um, have uh, 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 been destroyed by by this, and so people have got to move on to other players. But in the meantime, there are people who cannot afford to pay for gas in this kind of weather. What are they doing? Everybody has to adapt. I'm not saying that they have to adapt themselves, you know, and as a community, helping each other really, really matters. I think that's the sad thing about what has happened. Uh, and it's not just um, it's not just in Malaysia. We've always had, um, you know, the, the tribal beliefs that have uh, set us apart. And I'm a representative of what can happen when when they, they you know, my parents ignore it, right? Uh, they grew up... Um, singing God Save the Queen during the, the British times. And for them, um, you know, Malayu, Chinese, India, they all used to uh, live and work together. So I grew up with that mindset and I'm teaching that to my kids as well. Um, not to have a bias for or against uh, UK versus Malaysia. They're very curious about Malaysia. They love Malaysia. They want to go. To them, that's the exciting grass is greener, 
literally is greener <laughs> in Malaysia, uh, right? And in terms of you know bringing it back to my industry, uh, Asia is where a huge number of uh, big players are focusing their attention on in terms of um, investment um, because there's so much growth potential in Asia. So just look around you. Opportunities are there everywhere. Okay, parting shots, I know. Um, only three. Three, three kind of like salvos to people, young and old, boy or girl, Malaysia or UK, wherever in the world, right? Um, your three... I guess, commandments for success above and beyond everything else. Do you have them? And uh, sorry to put you on a spot like that, but... Um... Uh, uh, trust your eyes right. and see what's in front of you, not what you think is there. Because what we think is there is usually what we're afraid of. Uh, and that stops us from achieving many things and learning many things. Uh, that's one. Uh, the second one is be brave. It is difficult to to learn something new. Mm. The those paintings behind there, I did them um, for many years. I debated whether or not to be an artist, uh, and then one day I just decided to be one, and that was it. Uh, many years I uh, I agonized about whether to do an exhibition, uh, and then one day I decided to do it, and then I did it, and I've done a few. It's only the hardest the first time you do it, so try it. Well, fortune favors the brave, and there's not many people like you with a left brain and a right brain because, you know, some people would say you're in the minority, and you are in the minority. Oh, Weda, Weda, just on that point, let me finish with one last third one. Just on that topic, uh, um, I am this way because I allow myself to be. I think most people are left brain and right brain. It's just how much energy you put into developing it. I didn't become an artist because. I had uh, the ability to do it straight away. When I first started painting, I was painting dots and dashes, right? So, so you have to start somewhere and you have to build on it. Uh, some things don't happen just like that. Um, some things happen over a long period of time. And so you build on what you know and become what you want to be. Yeah, things shouldn't come easy. Things should be worked on before success comes. So. Uh, th that's the right message. I, I know it was a huge privilege, huge, huge uh, honor chatting with you. And, and again, thank you for talking to me all the way from the UK. Um, good luck, and I hope to see you in person soon when you come back to Malaysia or I come to the UK. Yeah, thank you very much, Trang, for this opportunity. Yeah, you take care of yourself. Take care. Bye. Thanks.